So um, this is a session about Sonic Software Architecture. I didn't name it as that, as that because I was thinking about other topics that I wanted to cover. So this is the agenda that we have in mind, Sonic Software Subsystems. Um, and eventually we're gonna talk about the interactions about those software components. Um, we're also gonna spend a few minutes on modularity and um, how can you import or create a Docker image from scratch and um, how you can upgrade systems with that Docker image without having to stop the rest of the subsystems. And um, we cover, we're gonna be covering the CLI very briefly. And um, that's pretty much what we have for today. So let's start. So this is probably the most important slide that we have today. Here, I'm trying to show all the software components that we have at Sonic. Uh, it's gonna be difficult for you guys in the back. Um, oh, you have some screens there, that's good. Um, so as you know, Sonic is basically built on these Docker components. Every single major um, subsystem is enclosed within a Docker container. These yellow lines that you see there dotted, they are basically that, they are just uh, a container. Um, there's only one exception there. If you look on the, to, the, uh, to the front, not to the front, if you look on the right hand side, a little bit on the center, uh, you will see that there's a CLI and Sonic Config Gen. Um, so that is the only sort of a subsystem that I'm not putting within a container because as a matter of fact, it's living in the host system. So um, other than showing all the dockers that we have here, the main rationale for putting this slide together is to show the interactions among these Docker containers. Um, those blue lines that you see there, that's basically the interaction of all the subsystems with the centralized infrastructure that we use, which is a, a Redis server, a Redis engine. And uh, the way that that works is there's a library within um, SDLDSS uh, component that basically is just like a wrapper on top of that Redis engine. This library is written in um, C++ and in Python. Basically, we are exposing bindings on Python and C++ so that whoever is uh, willing to um, interact, <coughs> excuse me, whoever is willing to interact with this database, they can, um, at compile time, they can link with that library. They can interact with the rest of the centralized um, subsystem. So yeah, that's a key point. Everything is based on that centralized architecture. All the messages, except those black lines that you see on the left-hand side, everything else is going through that centralized architecture, which is nothing but a Redis instance. Now, I talk about the libraries. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, how the communication can happen. So, this Redis server um, exposes a Unix socket, and this Unix socket is um, basically bi-mounted to the host file system. So. Um, all those Dockers, in order for them to reach access to that um, uh, Docker, I should say, to that ready socket, Unix socket, they have to basically bind mount that folder, that var slash run folder, so that they can uh, take advantage of that and they can you know, interact with that. So that's an important thing that is pretty much not mentioned anywhere that you should know. Uh, what else? Those black lines, you can see almost everything is blue, which means all the Sonic interactions with the database or with the SDLDSS that we're gonna talk uh, later on. Um, everything else is, um, I'm sorry, everything is blue except those black lines but that basically mean all the interactions with the kernel and the subsystems that are underneath. For example, from Psi, which is the container on the right at the bottom, that container talks to kernel obviously through a um, through a kernel in interface, there's no libraries there. And the same applies to things like Fine Monitor, Sensor D, those guys. Okay, so um, let's move to the next. So I'm planning to spend a couple of, well, more than a couple of minutes, maybe the next five minutes talking about uh, um, some theory, about what each subcomponent does. Uh, can get a little bit boring, but uh, before we move forward with the, uh, the interesting part, which is the interactions across um, um, boundaries, we need to understand what each sub-module does. So let's spend a few minutes there. So bear with me, it's gonna take probably five, seven minutes. So the platform monitor container, Joe talked a little bit about that. So there's a sensor D daemon, which is basically the guy that listens to whatever happens on the platform drivers. 
you know, the guy that talks to the monitor or to the temperature monitor sensors that are living on on the platform side. Basically, this is um, on the current on on the kernel side. Fan control is um, equivalent. It's also um, basically listening for events and for traps and for alarms coming from the platform monitor sensors and basically react on that. So coming back to the previous slide, that's what we're doing, right? You know, um, sensor D and fan control are listening to kernel and specifically fan control is sending information back. Information meaning um, instructions for that power, um, in this case, for the fan to spin faster or slower. So, you know, we use IOCTL or whatever interface is exposed by, by the driver. So that's, um, that's pretty simple. That's the platform monitor. <coughs> yes, yeah, go ahead. Of course, yes, please. Two questions. One, is Threadis multi-threaded? Um, Pimon and everything that is in Pimon, this is an open source project called Ellen Sensors. I'm not aware of any multi-threading. As a matter of fact, fan control is a bash script that basically reads sensors, reads alarms coming from kernel. I was talking about Redis itself, the server. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that part. Redis is single-threaded. So it's a guy, it's gating you. In yeah. Redis is single-threaded. It's extremely fast. It's, as you know, it's in memory and, and all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's one, one Redis instance. Uh, we can talk about that. As a matter of fact, probably we can talk about that later on again because um, as a matter of fact, we are planning to split that Redis into, into more instances in the near future to speed it up, basically, to your point. So looking at the scheme, if we take BGP as an example, it would be BGP running best pass, download to Zebra, Zebra choosing best route, going into Redis, Redis going into ASIC. Yeah. It sounds like slow, right? It is slow. Um, as a matter have you thought about doing, not multicast, but replicated download to Redis and to ASIC simultaneously? Um, not that I'm aware of, but at this point, that communication is pretty fast for us. We have bottlenecks, and I'm not saying that that's not a bottleneck. What I'm saying is that we have 100 bottlenecks before that. Eventually, we'll get there. But there are many other things at this point slowing us down. But yeah, we're looking at, at the Redis service multi-instance issue. So we look at the, the monitor. We look at, well, as a matter of fact, we haven't looked at the SNMP monitor or container. I will go pretty fast. It's really simple stuff. We have an SNMPD daemon, which is an open source project. We're cloning and we're invoking this. This is basically the SNMP server, the guys that listens to um, the host systems and you know the one that addresses the, the, the queries and um, and all the polling that comes from, from the network. There's an, um, obviously an agent X uh, within Sonic 2, uh, which is the guy that interacts with the back end, right? The ones that collects the information that the SMP subs subsystem is, re um, is requiring. And um, because that is the guy that interacts and share all the information with SNMPD, he obviously has to be subscribed to a bunch of tables on the back end. Things like Apple DB, you know, state DB counters, everything that, the, um, that we need to share with the rest of the SNMPD world, we have to obviously collect it from the system. So that's pretty intuitive and makes sense, right? So let's go faster in here. LDP container is not too far away from SNMP. It's pretty simple too. We have an LDP open source project that we're cloning from. Um, this guy is um, just addressing the... Uh, um, the traffic that comes uh, to the device and is sending traffic uh, to the network too. Um, then we have another CND process. This is the LDP CND process, which again is the guy that collects the information from LDP and um, and basically shares the state with the centralized infrastructure, which is in this case our Redis engine. Um, at this point, there's only one consumer of that information, as a matter of fact, which is SNMP. Otherwise, there wouldn't be really a need to share that much information because LDP is more like a consumer from the database standpoint. You are interested in consuming information to display it you know, to the rest of the LDP world. In this case, uh, SNMP is obviously interested in that state because we have some OIDs there. So that's why LDP CND is writing back to the database. 
And finally, we had uh, we have an LDP manager, which is nothing but um, the guy that is subscribed to the config in the state DB in order to collect information about uh, if the ports have been configured or not, and how to react on that, how to program LDP daemon um, so that he can share that inf information with the rest of the world. Um, it was pretty intuitive, um, I would say, at this point. Any questions so far? So this is what Jeff was talking about before. We have, obviously, the routing container, pretty straightforward. We have a VGPD daemon that talks that protocol and listens to everything that happens in the world. We have Sivra, which is just a rip, as you know. Um, does all the route selection, all, all the uh, redistribution, and um, basically push the state down to kernel and push the state also down to FPM. Um, so that is the way that um, the traffic eventually, I'm sorry, the routes and the state goes down to the databases. So before doing that, we need, again, another CD, another process that um, basically collects the information from the North Down application and adapt that somehow so that we can talk to the databases. So as you can see, there's kind of a pattern at this point. All this, let me go back again. All these applications that we're sitting, I mean, that we're seeing that are sitting on top have some sort of uh, daemon or process that has to adjust the information in order for them to talk to the databases, right? So we normally um, use the uh, CND uh, sort of uh, naming convention to refer to them. So everything that is named star CND is exactly that. Somebody that is collecting a state and is subscribing to the libraries, or I should say, subscribing to the databases that are exposed on Redis, and is the guy that is writing information and reading information from them. So that's an important pattern that we should uh, take into account. Let's see what else we have <clears throat> on the theory. So we cover BGP, and yeah, now we're getting to the final part of theory, which is uh, switch state services. So again, here we have uh, three demons that are doing, I would say, CND operations, which is on the poor CND side, you basically have to have somebody that is listening to the netlink messages that are coming from your kernel or from other applications. Um, so, you know, this also applies to interface CND. This is the guy that listens to whatever is happening um, on your system and is pushing that information to AppleDB. And finally, neighbor CD, something similar. Everything that is dealing with ARP, all that state has to be absorbed and pushed into our adjacency tables for rewrite um, operations later on. So as you can see, I pretty much spend um, half the time talking about CD processes, which is um, the producers of information in Sonic, the guys that collect state and push it somehow to the back end. So within SWSS, there are also some guys that are consuming the information. Let's talk about them. So these are, um, um, uh, as I said, um, these are the guys that are consuming the information that was just pushed. If we talk about orchestration agent, for example, this is definitely the most critical component in Sonic subsystem. So orchestration agent is, um, oops, sorry. So yeah, orchestration agent is doing more than um, consuming information. Or orchestration agent is also the guy that subscribes to the database and push information back. So or orchestration agent is acting as a reader and is also um, as a writer, which is not something that common. Most of the demons that I have talked so far are either writing or reading information. As a matter of fact, most of them are writing information. Orchestration agent is doing a bunch of stuff. We'll talk about that later. And finally, interface manager and VLAN manager, those are demons that are subscribed to config DB and state DB. We'll talk about the databases in a minute, by the way. And these are the ones that are configuring the system to cope with the uh, changes done in configuration. Um, for example, when you add an interface or when you define a VLAN, that kind of stuff. So I think that we cover all the dockers except CMD and database. Um, I kind of rushed through that. Um, 
CMD container is basically the abstraction of the hardware, right? But we de what we're doing here is you want to make sure that um, you have a, a way to talk to hardware that is always uniform and that um, um, is more or less um, consistent with all the hardware vendors, right? So that's the reason that we are relying on three logical components. These are not demons. These are logical components except CMD. CMD is one process that is linking to um, a SI API, which is the interface that we use to talk to all the vendors. And we're also linking to the specific ACK SDK that has been given by the vendor. So um, at build time, you build CMD, um, you link to these libraries, and this is the common interface that is gonna be used from that moment on. So um, I think that covers pretty much CMD. And finally, the database container which is nothing but um, the Docker container that hosts the Redis engine, uh, the Redis server. So the important part here that I want to spend a couple of minutes on is the databases, because we're talking about the databases all the time. Um, we obviously have Apple, Apple, no, Application DB, which stores all the state generated by the producers. Uh, here we have things like routes, and neighbors, interfaces. Um, everything that all those CMD guys produce, everything goes in there. We have the ConfigDB, which is obviously the database where you store configuration. You have StateDB, which, by the way, is kind of a, um, an ambiguous name that uh, I think it generates a lot of controversy. So let me maybe stop a couple of minutes talking about that. StateDB is not hosting, is not collecting state about routes or anything like that. Um, so it's not a state per se. A state DB is there only to deal with conflicts and dependencies. Think about um, you are writing or you are defining a VLAN, and that VLAN requires members, physical ports, but those physical ports are not there yet. You have to write somewhere the fact that you have a VLAN and there are no ports associated to it yet. So you're waiting for that. When the port is configured, somebody's going to read that database. is going to say, oh, okay, now I have the VLAN and I have the members. So that state, that's, that temporary state goes into state DB. Same applies with um, scenarios like um, lag. So state DB is the guy that is dealing with conflicts. There's no state there again. So, so finally, ACDB DB is the, I would say platform abstraction is, the, um, is basically the abstraction that we have to push all the state of hardware on a database that database follow a very different schema from the others. If you take a look at them, um, the, the idea is to keep something that is as user friendly to the hardware as possible. And that's why you know, the schema is very different from, from the rest. Um, Encounters DB, which is just counters, as you might expect. So now that we have done the boring part, <coughs> let's take a look at the interactions. So. Any questions so far, by the way? No? Okay, so I'm thinking about um, putting together some use cases, and um, I'm talking about those within the next few minutes. I'm talking about SMP and others. Um, so one of those use cases is SMP interactions, how information um, is processed when, for example, um, a poll comes to a sonic system. So can you? Oh wow, I realized that that image there, you guys won't see much, <laughs> very small. Um, well, the good thing is that you can read this, I guess. So during initialization of the SMP subsystem, what happened is that um, that process, the SMPD process, um, basically um, it fetches all the information that, um, that we have on the databases um, into a local cache. So um, this is what happens right before there's any polling or anything. You know, you initialize this Docker container, and um, the MIP subcomponent basically subscribes to the databases that he cares about. Those databases that I was talking about earlier, like you know, StateDB, config, and so on. So eventually, an SNMP query arrives at the SMP socket, and kernels redirect that into the user space to the SMP. So obviously, the SMP message is, uh, is sparse. And, uh, and it sends towards ESMP AGNX, which is the guy that processed the information. And as a matter of fact, it's the guy that 
has and holds the information, all that cash that I was talking about earlier. Um, eventually, that information is served back to SNMPD user, uh, daemon, and that information flows back to the user. So this is really intuitive. There's nothing new here, I would say. Let's go to the next use case, state interactions. So in the LDP case, um, during initialization, we have LDP manager, sorry, subscribes to the state DB to get the live feed of the state of the physical ports in the system. Um, basically, based on this information, um, this is the way that LDP basically keeps track of what is happening underneath, right? So there has to be someone that is listening to that state. That is um, LDP. So, um, so now let's go through the sequence of what happens when the packet arrives, right? Uh, point number one. So a packet comes to LDP. Um, we go to the next bullet. LDP parses this new state, which is eventually picked up by LDP CD. And um, as part of the execution of a CLI command, which is running within this script, um, we collect the information that just arrived to LDPD. And eventually, LDP CD, which is, as I said, the guy that talks to the backends, push that information into LDP entry table. And um, from that moment on, all the entities that are subscribed to that database, um, the LDP entry, are going to obviously have access to that. Yeah, go ahead. If LDP has a corrupted PDU, is that what you're saying? No, no, if Reddit server itself, all containers that exist. If there's a problem with the Reddit server itself, um, and it sort of crashes or it dies or something like that, um, well, we would need to obviously restart that subsystem. Um, at this point, if, you, if you're asking if there's an HA solution that keeps track of the state of the system and the dockers, um, we are, as a matter of fact, working on something like that. But right now, if there's something crazy like um, a ready server dies, which is a pretty solid demon at this point, um, you wouldn't have a way to know it. Obviously, you're going to get locks, but there's no way for the system to react on that. They will read once that the database is up. Um, as a matter of fact, that's a question. Um, I guess it depends on the sequence that those services or those other dockers, uh, dockers um, you know, for example, database is normally one of the first few systems or subsystems that are initialized, right? Because there's a lot of guys depending on that. So if um, the database goes down um, and the Docker D agent that or demon that lives in the host realizes that that's the case, um, I would expect the Docker to be restarted. Now, what I don't have is an answer for what about those subsystems or those Dockers that rely on that? That answer your question? <laughs> In a way? Thank you. Okay. So let's go next. Um, routing state interactions. So um, 
This is pretty straightforward. A BGP update comes um, to the kernel. It goes straight up to the BGP daemon. Um, BGP the process obviously parses the message and notifies Zebra of the existing of a new prefix or a new route. Um, upon understanding by Zebra that the feasibility and reachability of this next hop is there, we don't have a conflicting route, we don't have any problem with that, um, Zebra obviously will push this into the kernel. Um, at the same time, Zebra will push this information down to the FPM plane. So that eventually gets to um, FPM CD. So once again, FPM CD will collect this information and will push this all the way to um, the application DB. Once that it gets to the domain of the databases, um, now orchestration agent has access to this state. Orchestration agent is subscribed to this database. Orchestration agent collects this state um, and, it <clears throat> and it pushes this information all the way back to the database, but this time it obviously doesn't go to application DB. This time it goes to ASIC DB. And ASIC DB, as we said before, is the um, abstraction that we have um, to um, represent the information of hardware. So once that the information gets there, it's picked up by SYNC-D, and SYNC-D takes care of pushing this information down to hardware. So, yeah, go ahead. I was expecting a question for you. <laughs> I'm sorry, say that again? FPM sin D. FPM sin D is, um, is a very small daemon that the only thing it's, do, it's doing is um, it's linking to the libraries that is the LDSS gives you so that you have a way to communicate with the databases or with the backends. So it's, 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 it's all it's doing. It's not like Zebra. It's not like in any high level um, entity that is doing a lot of stuff. It's just simply adjusting or mass hashing the information that you get from Zebra and push it down to her data store. That's all. FIP is, um, is, is living on the Zebra itself. And from Zebra is pushed to kernel, that elected FIP, that chosen FIP is pushed to kernel, and that same elected set of routes and prefixes is pushed to FPM. Goes both ways. Yes, 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 yes. It goes through the entire process. So yeah, I think that I got your question. So um, you have a copy of FIP. I think that's what you're getting. You, you have the copy of FIP in different places. You have it in kernel. You have it in, um, in um, obviously, in Zebra. And you have it in ACDB, too. OK, so poor state interactions. So if we take a look at what's happening when um, we lose a link, these are the set of steps that, um, that would actually occur. Um, you're going to get a, no a notification from an ASIC optical module. You're going to send a notification up to, uh, to SYNC-D. SYNC-D will invoke um, his handler and will send a port down event towards ASIC DB. Once the information is in ASIC DB, Again, orchestration agent can um, pull it and can read it. And um, or orchestration agent, as a matter of fact, will use a notification handler. Um, and we'll do two things with that. One thing, it, it will update the application DBs because somebody has to tell the rest of the northbound applications that that port is now down. So you have to write in, into that database. And at the same time, orchestration agent is pushing a message back to ASICDB to instruct the hardware, in this case, SYNC-D, which is his abstraction, um, to update the host interfaces. Because somebody, again, has to bring down those host interfaces, because at that point, no one has done it yet. So um, yeah, sorry that you cannot read the, uh, the sequence of events, because it's too far away. But um, I guess that we can share the documentation later, if somebody's interested. Go ahead. BFD. I mean, you need BFD to interact with hardware layer. If you go through Redis, you are too late. B BFD, obviously, are you thinking about BFD control plane or BFD down in hardware? Down in hardware. So um, I guess that, you know, well, the first thing is we don't have that yet. But if we were, have, if we were to have that, 
I guess that you will need to, you know, notify CD in the same way that, you know, that the hardware has lost, for example, three keep lives on BFD and now the port's being torn down. And if your point is that there's going to be some latency involved, definitely it is. The architecture that we have in place today, there's going to be a latency because you have to close that loop. So much more closer to your use case, fast rehash. So when you lose one of the ECMP bundle members, you need to notify your driver to rehash traffic over remaining buckets. And it has to be done within millisecond, pretty much below. In terms of load balancing or in terms of uh, when you have a lag, I didn't quite... So you, when you've got your ECMP bundle? Oh, and um, we have as you, you, you wouldn't do fast rehash, you would do fast rehash because oh, ECMP no, no, no. paths are loop free, right? I think, yeah, I got it now, yeah. So um, in case that you lose a leg of one of your next hub groups, obviously you're not gonna go through all that iteration. You're gonna go to uh, or orchestration agent. You gotta go to that level. Orchestration agent will need to um, basically update um, your next hub group, which now is gonna be passing from, let's say that you have four members uh, originally and now you have three. Somebody has to do that process of data, but it's not going to BGP. That's why you're asking. It's not going all the way up. Would it go to Redis? Everything has to go to Redis because Redis is the mechanism to allow the communication between processes. So SYNCD is writing to ACDB. ACDB allows somebody to read it, which is orchestration agent. And there's still going to be some latency, but just to make sure that we're in the same page, this is not involving BGP. BGP will converge eventually. You're still talking yes. milliseconds. Yes. Well, I don't know how much, but yeah, there's some latency there. It's not done in hardware. The convergence is not done in hardware. You've seen the proper implementation. You need M try and hardware and just move pointers. Sure. Okay, so I have one last poor state interaction. Um, I, I thought about adding more interaction, but I think it will be enough. You know, I'm not talking about neighbor interactions or state interactions, as you say, or interfaces or things you know, um, that I would say that, that people are normally interested on. But um, I think that the four examples that I have are good enough to show um, the level of interactions that you have in a Sonic ecosystem and how things play out. So I'm gonna finish with uh, one last port state interaction. This is about how the ports are initialized when the system boots up or when um, most of the subsystems come up. Um, and the reason that I picked this example is because here all the databases are involved all the databases that we care about. Like for example, a state DB, which is something that we really haven't seen an example on. So let's go through that quickly. Uh, what happens during initialization is that porcing D establishes a communication uh, with the databases, as all the other processes do. Um, and porcing D does a parsing, uh, basically parses information that is hardware specific. It parses port config any, which is information that is given um, by the user, and that is specific to the hardware itself, to the SKU that you're basically running. So in that file, you have things like lanes, like MTU, like uh, that, th you know, those kind of attributes. So PortCD parses that information and push all that into app and the application DB. Now, orchestration agent reads all that information, it parses that, but it doesn't act on that right away. It's waiting for Porcin D to finish doing all the reading, all the parsing process. Once that happens, um, orchestration engine goes ahead and proceeds to, um, you know, to push all the state to um, sing D. Again, it uses the ACDB uh, interface that we talked about before. And uh, once that this state is in sing D, um, um, sing D obviously invokes to say, uh, the SI APIs in the ACK SDKs to create the kernel host interfaces asso associated to those ports. So as part of that, as part of that process, um, there's a netting message that, that is going to be generated, right? Once that those host uh, interfaces are created. So um, those netting messages associated to those uh, port creation is going to come back to ports in the and um, PortCD is going to act on that, right? Because PortCD is listening on that, on that netlink channel. So once that PortCD has a notification of creation of every single port interface, only then is that PortCD is going to declare the port initialization done. 
and only then it's going to write an entry for every single port into the state DB. So this is a, an example of how state DB works. I mean, all the applications that are subscribed to state DB are going to be waiting for that green light in order for them to proceed. Things like Team D that is doing lag, things like uh, um, LDP, you know, all, the, all those applications, things like VLAN Manager, which is the guy that basically configures the VLAN interfaces or interface manager D. All those guys are sitting there waiting till ports in D completes this entire cycle. And the way that they know is because there's an entry in state DB that hosts that information. So that is the mission of state DB, okay? Um, so that's pretty much it, what I have on the port state interactions, I'm sorry, on the state interactions. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have any question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what is coming is um, very short. Uh, I have probably like three or four slides more. Um, it's not going to be about architecture. It's going to be more about um, modularity, for example. Um, I was asked to talk about this topic. How do you basically get a module, a software component? You build it, you re re rehash it, do your changes, and you incorporate that into Sonic. So how do you do that? So we picked the example of what we did with FR. So before I'm able to explain sort of a high level view of what we did, I need to spend a couple of minutes talking about the Sonic build infra. So um, for those of you that don't know, um, all Sonic artifacts are built within yet another Docker that we call it the slave, the Docker slave. Everything is built inside that, in, inside that Docker. The build image uh, make file, the make file that we all see, is just a wrapper to build that slave container. That's not the real um, make file that we use to build um, the targets that we need for Sonic. So the real make file is the one that is called a slave MK. That is the one that basically processes all the targets that are defined on the recipe files, which are in the rules folder. And, um, and that's the one that really does the heavy lifting. Um, now, another important point is that um, all the Docker files, I shouldn't say Docker, all the Docker information, or I should say, all the information is specific to how do you build a Docker. For example, the Docker file itself, or things like um, how do you initialize that Docker? You obviously want to have a process manager within that Docker, you know, um, something like supervisor D, um, or what is the entry point of that Docker, how that Docker is going to boot up. All that information that is relevant to how you initialize the Docker, that has to be placed in place in one folder location, which is the one that I highlight there. And uh, finally, if you want to enable certain things um, that not everyone is interested on, like for example, if you want to flip your elected routing stack from Quagga to FR, there's a common place that we're referring as a config file, which is again in the rules folder. And then you just go there and you just flip the value. You can easily do that today, that's supported. Um, so now to the specific case of FR, um, basically what you need is to define one recipe file, one building instruction or set of instructions of how to build um, your Docker. So that is equivalent to what we already have for the other 10 or 11 Dockers that we support. Um, so you also need to, um, um, I already talked about the Docker file. I think that that's, that's clear enough. Um, you also need to, um, you know, obviously if you're, if you're trying to have a, like a one-off moment, if you just want to incorporate an image of a Docker into a Sonic subsystem, uh, you can just go ahead and jump to any Sonic device right now, and you can just do a Docker load, and you're loading the image because Sonic is nothing but a Linux system, right? Now, if you want to have Sonic taking care of that image as a service itself, you will need to create something else. You will need to do something extra. That's why I'm putting the bullet here that you need to um, define a service file right, that represents that Docker that you're planning to instantiate. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, those are the four actions that you need to take care of in order to create a new Docker within the Sonic ecosystem. Um, 
uploading an image. So that's one of the advantages that Sonic provides, right? We don't really need to restart or build an entire only image to be able to upgrade a subsystem. That Docker image that we just built, FR in this case, you can just jump to the box, as I said before. You, you do a Docker load, you do a Docker stop, you have to stop the previous instantiation of that Docker, in this case, Quagga, and then you are, obviously you have to remove that Docker, and only then you can just instantiate your new Docker. So as, as you see, there's nothing here that requires affecting any of the other components in the system. Um, in principle, you could just do that. If you're talking about a, a subsystem that doesn't interact with anyone else, you are free to go. You don't have to have a complete only image in order to make this work. Um, in the case of FR, um, you just need to add just one service file, the service file that I was talking about before, so that whenever the subsystem is rebooted again, um, Sonic, or I should say Linux, knows which service to instantiate. Now, instead of calling the Docker FPM Quagga, now you're going to be calling Docker FPM FR. Very small change, very subtle. So the last step is obviously you just go ahead and launch your service. So um, um, that's pretty much what I had for um, the creation of, yeah, go ahead. So you show specifically BGP example, but the container is going to be FRR's hull. So if I decide to run SS tomorrow, it's going to be already there, just not started as a service, correct? Exactly, yeah. So those Docker images that you're importing are within the Docker engine. Those are not going to go anywhere. As a matter of fact, the Docker if, um, Quagga image that was already there still is going to be there. And you can, as a matter of fact, you can roll back anytime you want. You can say, now I'm killing the new FR Docker, and I'm instantiating, making use of the old image. Now I'm instantiating a new all Quagga image. My Docker. point was, you are not extracting BGP of FRR. Your container is fully blown FRR, where only BGP is run. Yes, I mean, within that container, within that container, you have the entire full-blown FR image. As you said, the only thing that is changing is that we are only enabling BGP. As part of those configuration files that I talked about before, which are Docker specific, you can define any configuration that you want. You can just go in FR case to the daemons file and say enable ISIS or SPF and you're done. And when you build as part of the Docker creation image, everything is gonna be already there for you. Um, and finally, uh, we have a very extremely high level CLI overview. There's only one slide. Apologize, they didn't have time for more. Um, I think that, um, you know, what I did is just basically put pointers here. Um, Sonic CLI is something that um, I find it to be extremely natural, intuitive, because uh, for the first time, at least in my experience, you're not relying on an ecosystem or uh, some sort of container where you're jumping off and then you don't have access to shell and things like that. The Sonic container is embedded. It's part of the Linux subsystem. It's part of the shell. You can uh, have access to your favorite tool, set, AWK, everything is there for you. So how we do that, we make use of um, a Python module, which is called Click, and um, that allows you to um, basically build tools on a very friendly basis and um, um, it's something that, as a matter of fact, we could quickly take a look. I'm not sure how we're on time. I think we're almost on track. Um, so I could show you how one command looks. I'm not sure you will be able to see from there. I'm not sure if, um, how many of you have ever interacted with a Sonic box and with the CLI itself? So. There are, there are a bunch of you that haven't ever seen the CLI, right? Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we're going to be able... I, I cannot even read it myself. I don't see that slide from here. <laughs> Let's see. The problem that I have is that I don't see that, so I, if I can place the mouse over there, maybe I can just scroll or zoom in, but, oh, now, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we got it now. Zoom doesn't work. Try using the, the, the key 
Still working. Is it better? <laughs> hey there. Now it's working. Huge latency? That's not Sonic. <laughs> what was that? Things that I don't see. I don't see that, so I can oh. Okay, let's speak a very simple command of um, of Sonic. So something like um, something very intuitive, like uh, uh, these are not that intuitive. What is it? Simple things like uh, time, uptime, that kind of stuff. Memory. Okay, this one, system memory. So. You know, click module is basically taking care of most of the things for us. You know, it provides a help um, sort of um, um, dialogue or um, um, functions. You know, you just have to populate um, those classes initialization so that you are able to provide certain help to the user. And you also specify in this line here, for example, what are the attributes that your command is going to take. Um, and um, you obviously define your Python function, and um, and eventually you just go ahead and call whatever you want to call. It could be a Linux shell command like free minus m, or it could be a, a Quagga or an fr um, action like you know vtysh and jump to that Docker and do something. Um, so as you can see, it's just a wrapper that allows you to do things, and you don't have to take care, or you don't have to think about anything related to the UI or how the CLI looks. Everything is intuitively done for you. The only thing you almost almost the only thing you got to do is write there what is the command that you want to execute. Of course, this is the simplest case. Uh, it can get a little bit more complex than that. Um, let's see if I have another more. Um, I'm looking for something that we did. Um, basically, you know. Click is modular enough and flexible enough to allow you to change the parse chain. You know, let's say that you have two routing stacks like FR and Quagga. You could split your parse chain to say, you know what, if what is running right now is BGP, just go ahead and fetch that set of instructions for your CLI. If what is running is Quagga, just do the opposite. So Click allows you to do all that. Um, it's very intuitive. And we have that uh, as part of this file that I don't know exactly where. So. Um, that's pretty much it. It was a really condensed, uh, small overview. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'm not, which CLI you talking about? So like in the October release, there's a feature named CLI framework that's planned. I'm not talking about that. Uh -huh. I'm talking about the legacy thing that we have in Sonic. Okay, so I believe that you're talking about the CLI that was built on top of um, the Quagga FR CLI framework. I believe that you're talking about that. So that is another CLI. That's not the Sonic legacy okay. current CLI. So you're saying this is not new. This has been there for like... This has been there already for, okay. yeah, okay. Just, just a year or so. That's fine. Any other questions? So I understand you have the CLI framework and then you can uh, plug in all the commands. So my question is, say I have plenty of uh, configuration uh, on the box and then I want to save it and then after next time when it pulls up, it will be automatically configured uh, on the box. Mm -hmm. So how is that uh, configuration and will be automatic? Because it's when you configure, CLIs, there are some dependencies, so you have you have to have something uh, pre-configured, and you have to follow so certain sequ sequence. How is this done in your uh, replay kind of? Uh, are you talking about the scenario where you just change something, or are you talking about a s scenarios where you change something in your CLI, I meaning yeah. the Python code itself? Yeah, what I mean is uh, I config 
plenty of things like say uh, some IP address, VLAN, and sure. the, yeah. uh, lag, all these kind of things. And then when yeah. I saved it and uh, I want... Next yeah, that's time. fine. So all that state goes into uh, the um, Sonic configuration file today, which we normally call, uh, we refer to as configdb.json. Everything is stored there. Um, so um, most of those, as a matter of fact, all the um, all those configuration attributes that you mentioned are hosted there today. Um, that doesn't mean that anything that you might want in the future is already there. So, you know, for example, um, in LinkedIn, we're using certain functionality that is not already part of config DB JSON. So things that are related to the routing stack, we are dumping that state into a different file. We're not using config DB JSON for that. You could do that too. If you eventually find yourself in a scenario where you have a daemon that doesn't have a schema and database, that doesn't have um, an, a parser that consumes that information currently, you can just go ahead and jump you know, and do something else. You could just go ahead and define your own configuration file and have your specific daemon parse that configuration file directly without having to evolve ConfigDBJSON. Does that? It means I have to uh, implement my own uh, uh, configuration files and also when the system reboots, I pass okay. the config. For the example that you asked me, which is VLAN um, interfaces, you don't need to do anything at all. You save everything in ConfigDBJSON, you restart, and it will read it and it will take it from there. I'm talking about next steps in case that you want to do something that is not already there. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. C can I add something? I, I think the maybe the question, if I understand correctly, is that you know the first time you configure follow a sequence, so the next time when you try to, for example, reboot, uh, how can the Sonic find out the sequence and apply them correctly, right? So, yeah. So, um, um, you know, um, in the previous slides, there there is a several agents, you know, interface managers, VLAN managers, other managers, so they are reading the configs from the config DB. So when you start from fresh, so those managers uh, have a dependency between each other. For example, you have to uh, create a VLAN first before you sign IP to that VLAN. So what it does that uh, uh, those agents interact with each other through the state DB. So for example, um, when, the, when the VLAN manager creates a VLAN, then he writes this uh, um, VLAN into the state DB, so say this VLAN has been created, and then the interface manager, which configs the IP, listen to the uh, state DB interest. Only when that VLAN has been created, then the interface manager will look at the config DB to find out the uh, IP address, it, config the IP, and then config that VLAN. So those uh, sequences are guaranteed by using the state DB and then... So basically you have a, a building a dependency state DB. So in case, say, if I create a VLAN, assign an IP and then delete that VLAN and then create an a, a IP address again, so you won't, be, you won't do you know, the sequence the same as I did in the CRI, but you will uh, do the last configuration uh, stored in the DB. I think that's what you do. Yeah, so you know, the system is designed to achieve this uh, eventual consistency. So basically what's in the config DB is, uh, um, is a goal that, you know, all those agents are interacting to drive to that goal. Yeah, so, you know, the dependency is, um, is uh, expressed through the state DB.